Thank you, Pastor. Well, continue to thank the Lord for Pastor Jesse and Norma and the tremendous leadership that they're giving right here at Valley Life Church. And in the back room during the praise and worship uh, session, we were getting ready to pray to come out. I felt the Lord uh, give me a word for the church. You know, the children of Israel went away to Babylon, and then Cyrus let them come back, and they were building the temple. And it was small, and the, the Lord said, despise not the day of small beginnings, for the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. God has great blessings for Valley Life Church. Well, I've got some of my books. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Sonny to show some of them. Uh, one is called Miracles in American History, and there are times in our country's past where there's a crisis, they pray, things turn around. Revolution, War of 1812, Civil War, Barbary Pirate War. And, um, uh, and then another book is called Who is the King in America? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, then uh, we put our videos on flash drives because DVDs are going out of style. So we've got like 40 different presentations on one flash drive, and then there's lots of them out there. So thank you, Sonny. And, um, you know, there's so much of our history that people don't know. I, uh, one of the stories I put together was that uh, the King of Spain helped America become independent of Britain. And you're like, the King of Spain? Yeah, it's called, um, he wanted to help fund America, but he was working on a treaty with Britain over something in Portugal. And so he funded the Rodriguez, Hortez, and company in France. And he funneled millions of dollars through this company to fund the American Revolution. And then the uh, governor of New Spain was Bernardo de Galvez. And he drove the British out of the Gulf of Mexico. And he captured Pensacola from the British. And he allowed ships to come up the Mississippi, to supply George Washington's troops. And then Washington is at, and by the way, they, they decided to name a city after Bernardo de Galvez, Galveston, Texas. And, and there's a statue of him in Washington, D.C. And then you had Georgetown, or Yorktown. So George Washington has the British cornered at Yorktown, but his men have not been paid for a year. And they're beginning to slip away. And the, the army is about to collapse right at the verge of victory. And so the French Navy is coming over, but they stop off in Cuba. And when the governor of Cuba realizes that George Washington is in financial need, the ladies of Havana raise an equivalent of $28 million. They're giving their jewelry, their silverware, their candelabras, everything. And they said when uh, they brought it to George Washington, he took his hat and threw it in the air. And, uh, and it says that the ladies of Havana supplied the bottom dollar upon which the United States independence was built. Stories that we don't know about. And so it's important to realize that America is unique because it allowed the people to be in charge of their lives. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. The default setting for human government is gangs. If we were to get rid of all police tomorrow, you'd have gangs. And a gang leader with enough power we call a king. So a king is just a glorified gang leader. And that's the norm. And so you have Nimrod, Tower of Babel. And then you have uh, Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, and Sargon of Acadia. And as the 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs and 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, kings of Assyria, kings of Babylon, kings of Persia. And as the centuries go on, the kingdoms get bigger. Because with military advancements, the kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear or a scimitar sword or gunpowder, right? And then with technological advancements, kings can track more people. Did you know 2 BC, Augustus Caesar wanted to have a worldwide tracking system? It was called the census, a tax enrollment. If he could add 5G and cell phones and facial recognition software, he'd have been tempted to use that. And so these kingdoms keep getting bigger and bigger. Anybody that can plot on a graph... Right, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, uh, the Islam, uh, can see that at some point it's going to max out on a global level. Right? And Jesus says wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And so you see these empires getting bigger and bigger. But I want to stop with the one part. And so in the 1500s, you have uh, the Reformation take place. Now where, the, where there's a king... 
the kingdom has to believe what the king believes. What the king believes, the kingdom has to believe. Right? Remember uh, Nebuchadnezzar made everybody bow to his statue. And he said, if you don't, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And so kings considered it treason if you believe something other than what they wanted you to believe. And so when the Reformation started in 1517, you had large percentages of countries believing something different than their king. And kings didn't like that. And so uh, you have um, King Philip of Spain. He sends the Iron Duke of Alba to Antwerp, Holland in 1572, kills 10,000 of these Dutch reformed. The Queen of France, Catherine de' Medici, 1572, that was a bad year. Um, she does not like the Huguenots. These are French Protestants. About 10% of France is French Protestants. So she arranges a marriage in Paris with her daughter Margaret and the main Protestant leader, Henry of Navarre. A couple of days after the wedding, she sends her soldiers house to house. They kill 30,000 of these French Protestant Huguenots called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And so you have a situation of Bible scholars struggling, what do you do with Romans chapter 13? Let everyone be subject to the governing authority, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that is if have been, exist have been established by God. Yeah, but what if the authority that exists wants to kill your wife and kids? Do you just submit to that? Okay, here they are, kill them. And so People protested, and they were nicknamed Protestants, or Protestants. And uh, one was John Calvin, and he says, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. In other words, it's like Ephesians 6, children obey your parents. But what if there's a bad parent, and he tells the kid to kill the neighbor and sell themselves into prostitution? Is the child supposed to obey that parent? No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. I mean, why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just got done telling you to do? And so it's very similar to Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. How does one determine if a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. If the law squares with the law of God, you obey it. If not, you don't. And so the kings was the norm. And so when the Reformation happened, you had people studying how to have a government without a king. And these were Calvinists and Puritans. And they came up with something called a covenant form of government. Everybody needs to be involved and participate. And this way we can rule ourselves without a king. Where did they get their idea? From ancient Israel. And it's this idea you get blessings from God, you voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. It's not socialism where the government takes away your stuff involuntarily and gives it to their supporters. No, you get the stuff, it's yours. And so this covenant form of government is what Israel had. Now, what part of the Bible did it come from? This is interesting. It came from that first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. Right? So you have around 1400 BC, millions of Israelites come out of Egypt, come into the promised land, and for 400 years there is no king. It works because everybody is taught the law and everybody is personally accountable to God to follow the law. And it worked. And they were able to have a society without a king. And, um, and it, it, it's called the Hebrew Republic. And the Puritans that studied this were nicknamed Christian Hebraists. James Harrington, John Sadler, whose sister Anne Sadler married John Harvard. So they taught Hebrew at Harvard and Yale. And uh, it worked until the priest stopped teaching the law. You said, they did? Yeah, here's Eli, the high priest. His own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then there's a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. 
And the tribe of Dan comes along and steals the graven image and tells this Levite, come along with us. You can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're reading the story, scratching your head, saying, what's this Levite doing with a graven image? Isn't it one of the commandments? He's not following them. And then the terrible story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is, here he is with the woman he's not even married to. So he's not following the law. They're traveling, and the house is surrounded by sodomites. Something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves. This casting off of self-restraint. And the poor girl's you know, raped to death, and by the time you're grossed out, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priest stopped teaching them what was right in the Lord's eyes. They lost their knowledge of the law. They lost their fear of God. It turns out everybody doing whatever they want. It turns into lawlessness and chaos, and they all go to Samuel the prophet, and they say the self-government system's not working anymore. We want to be like the other countries. We want a king. And Samuel cries, and the Lord told Samuel, they did not reject you. They rejected me. God's original plan for ancient Israel was to not have a king, have everybody be taught the law, and everybody personally accountable to God to follow the law. And so they get King Saul, and one story is sort of telling. He's pouting that his son, Jonathan, became friends with David. And he turns to his soldiers, and he goes, none of you soldiers care about me. And one Doeg the Edomite said, King, I care. I saw David go to this town, and the priest gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath that was stored there. David says, bring those priests to me. Well, they show up. He turns to his soldiers and says, kill him. The soldiers hesitate. Doeg the Edomite goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system where everybody's accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. There's only one witness, Doeg. So the soldiers are like, you're telling me to kill, and I'm accountable to God, and there's only one witness and two. And they're hesitating. They still have a conscience. Doeg the Edomite says, king, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. Tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. You tell me there's no more male and female, fine. Tell me, I'm just a bunch of mush. I'll do whatever the government tells me to do. And um, so why is this story important? Because the kings of Europe looked to the Bible for their authority, but they looked to the King Saul and on part of the Bible, the divine right of kings. The Calvinists and the Puritans and the Baptists and the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians and the Quakers that founded America, they looked to the pre-King Saul period, this 400-year period, millions of people, no king. It works because everybody is taught the law and everybody's personally accountable to God to follow the law. So King Saul is the divider between England and America. Both of them are looking to the Bible, but the ones in England, they want theocracy. Do what I believe what I tell you or I'm going to burn you at the stake. They have their dominion, right? Dominionism. They have their, their rule in top down. I don't want you to ask questions. You just do what you're told. And yet in America, we're like, no, no, we, we flee that. We're the republic. We're the ones that we get to rule ourselves. And so... This covenant form of government is what America was based on. Jesus, and it, and it actually starts with the different types of church government. So the Reformation happened. They had theological uh, discoveries in the Bible, but also church government styles. And so Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And that word church in Greek is ekklesia. E-K, ek means out of. Ecclesia means a calling. So 6,000 citizens in Athens, and they would call them out of their homes to the Agora marketplace, and they would all get involved in fixing the city. We need to fix the walls. We need to get the Navy going. We need to take care of the kids. We need... And they would divide up the responsibilities. And Jesus chose that word to say, upon this rock, I'll build my, my body. Everybody's got to be a part, an eye, an ear, a foot. All right, We all get involved, and we're all making this thing happen. And, um, and so it's called a covenant form of government. Uh, the Congregationalists and Quakers in Scotland, they call them conventicles because of covenant small groups. And um, John Smith and Thomas Hellwise were some of the founders of the Baptist Church in England. And uh, they had a congregational church body. And if you look at the bottom of this book cover, 
First Baptist Church in England, at the bottom it says, with fresh light upon the Pilgrim's Father's Church. Lo and behold, the Pilgrims branched off of this Baptist Church, and they had a congregational form of government. And so the covenant congregational model is where the, where the pastor equips the saints to do the work of the ministry. Whereas the hierarchical clergy lady model is what the king had, the pastor does all the ministry while the lady is lazy and watches them. <laughs> so the congregational model, the pastor sees his role as helping every person to have a, a direct relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ that died on the cross to pay for their sins. And then the pastor coaches each individual to become a mature Christian. You get in the habit of reading through the Bible yourself and praying every day and plugging into the body and doing something. Because everything that's alive takes in and gives out. For every muscle to grow, it has to be exercised. You don't just hear a really good sermon. You hear a really good sermon, and then filled with the Word of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, you put yourself in a position where there is a need. Nursery, children's church, junior high, outreach, something. Get involved in the government. And the Holy Spirit will use you and enlighten the Word and use you to help meet the need. And he that's faithful in the very little shall be entrusted with more. And then you get more and you grow in your spiritual maturity, and, and you end up becoming another leader, and the body of Christ grows. The king did not like that. He liked the hierarchical model of church government. Why? Because he was at the head. And the Archbishop of Canterbury and Archbishop of York and the deaneries and vicars and curates and rectors and priests and your relationship with God is through this big hierarchical structure. The clergy does all the ministry and the lady is lazy and watches them. Where the congregational model is the pastor teaches the saints to do the work of the ministry. So the king of England said, I will make them conform themselves or else I will harry them out of the land. And so you had these pilgrim separatists, these branching off the Baptists, they fled to the Netherlands. And then after 12 years, they fled to America. And they were going to go to Jamestown and submit to the king's government, but they get blown off course in a storm. And they land in Massachusetts. And they try sailing south, but off the coast of Massachusetts, it's really shallow. And, uh, and so uh, 3,000 ships have sunk off the coast of Cape Cod called the graveyard of ships, and uh, they, the, pa the, the captain of the ship says, everybody off the boat, and these pilgrims are like, well, we have a question. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to tell us what to do? And so they do something unique. They give themselves the authority to start a government. It's called the Mayflower Compact, and it says, we, in the presence of God, covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic. They take their church form of government, a covenant form of government, and they make it their civil body politic. You have a church group forming itself into a civil body politic. This was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Instead of top-down rule by kings, it's bottom-up rule by we, just 102 of us in this little boat. And so um, it's the difference between a dead pyramid ruled top-down through fear and a living tree, bottom up, where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep the tree alive. Everybody has to be a part. It's the difference between divine right of kings, God chose, chose me like he chose Saul, and I'm going to rule through fear, or we, the people, where we rule ourselves, bottom up. And uh, so pilgrim pastor John Robinson said, we are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord tied to care for each other's good. And then Puritan leader John Winthrop said, this love among Christians is a real thing necessary to the body of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor, and suffer together. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. And so Os Guinness said covenantal ideas in England were the lost cause but they became the winning cause in New England. Covenant-shaped constitutionalism. The American Constitution is a nationalized, secularized form of cov covenant. Covenant lies behind Constitution. And did you know the word federal is Latin for covenant? We have a covenant form of government where we rule ourselves bottom-up. 
It came from these New England pastors that got it from the Bible, what part of the Bible, this first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. And uh, so then you had the great Puritan migration where 20,000 Puritans come to New England and pastors and churches are founding cities. And so you have a pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts, and a pastor, Roger Williams, and his church founded Providence, Rhode Island, and the First Baptist Church in America. A pastor, John Wheelwright, and his church founded a city, Exeter, New Hampshire, and a pastor, Thomas Hooker, and his church founded Hartford, Connecticut, and the First Congregationalist Church in America. This was unique on planet Earth. At this time, you had Muslim sultans, Russian czars, African chieftains, kings of Spain, France, and Austria, Chinese emperors, Japanese emperors, Indian maharajas, the whole world is kings. And here you have this little greenhouse in America where pastors and their churches are founding cities. And so uh, let's look at Thomas Hooker. He founds Hartford in 18, 1638, and his church members ask him to preach a sermon on how they're supposed to set up their government. And so he gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the free consent of the people. This is reflected in our declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe did not ask the people for their consent. And his sermon says the privilege of election belongs to the people. This is reflected in our constitution, we the people. His sermon's written down, it's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. And it is the constitution of Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. For nearly two centuries, Hartford, Connecticut, is using Pastor Thomas Hooker's sermon as its constitution. And so Connecticut's called the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. A statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the old Capitol grounds in Hartford. At the base, it says, leading his people through the wilderness, he founded Hartford. On this side, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, here minister Thomas Hooker, peerless leader in New England thought in life in both church and state. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, a leader, statesman, preacher who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. This was a big deal in world history. You have kings and pharaohs and Caesars for all the way back to Nimrod. It's all kings. And here you have a flip where, no, it's government from the consent of the governed. They chiseled it in stone so we wouldn't forget it. Another plaque, and it says, uh, here preached Thomas Hooker, his famous sermon, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. This is reflected in our constitution, excuse me, in the fundamental orders of Connecticut. The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Who are the people? It's Pastor Thomas Hooker and his little covenant congregational church. So you have a church group conjoining itself into a public state, very similar to the pilgrims, a church group covenanting itself into a civil body politic. Now, why did they do this? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess. They wanted to preserve the freedom of the gospel where you, you have the freedom to believe, not being burned at the stake by some king. Another plaque, this one says... Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Again, our Constitution is based on these colonial constitutions, which are based on these pastor sermons, which are based on the Reformation, which are based on the Bible, what part of the Bible, that first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. And so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't preach on politics when it's the pastor's sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were no non-church members in Hartford to be lazy and let them run stuff. And so the word polis is Greek for city. Indianapolis, Minneapolis, and politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city of Hartford was the church members. Everybody's involved in church. Everybody's involved in the city. And so they had one building called a meeting house. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbi would teach the law, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. I mean, why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so the Revolutionary War starts, and the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage. 
and he outlaws meeting houses. Democracy too prevalent in America. We don't need the people meeting and giving their consent to stuff. You just obey government mandates. And we're like, no, 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 in America, we have a century under our belt of nothing happening unless we give our consent to it. And he's like, no, you obey government mandates. And we're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent to it. <clears throat> and he's like, no, you're a zombie. You're a robot. You just do what you're told. When the government says jump, you jump. We're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent to it. Turned into a revolutionary war, and we won. And so we are a government. We, the people. And we rule with our consent. So Romans 13 is understood differently in a monarchy versus a republic. In a monarchy, subjects, kings have subjects who are subjected to the king's will. In a monarchy, monarchy subjects obey. In a republic, citizens give consent. In a monarchy, subjects submit to the king. In a republic, citizens are the king. So this is the 1600s. It's a revolutionary covenant form of government. Came from Israel the first 400 years out of Egypt. And it turned into our country, we the people. And it's a great plan. <clears throat> but after a century of teaching it at Harvard and Yale, it got a little dry. It became only a plan. And you had them saying, okay, God has a plan for your life, your marriage, your family, your church, your government. Find out what the plan is. Put it into place. Well, some of them took it to the next step and said, well, God already knows who's going to end up in heaven, so don't even bother preaching the gospel. And so they stopped even preaching the gospel. David Brainerd got expelled from Yale because he said his professor was as spiritual as a chair. And then the Yale students got reprimanded because they were going into the town of New Haven and presenting the gospel to strangers in pubs. It's like, no, you're only supposed to present the gospel formally in church where you're wearing the black robe and everything, and that's disrespectful. And so they were nicknamed Old Lights. And so in the 1700s, you have the New Lights. These are called pietists, and they said it's more than a plan you have to have a personal experience with Jesus, but when you do, you're going to withdraw from worldly things like bars and brothels and loot theater and get involved in government. Wait, what's that last thing? Yeah, government, it's filled full of worldly people, and if you're really a Christian, you're not going to do worldly things anymore. So whereas the Calvinist Puritan says, hey, everybody get involved. We can rule ourselves without a king. These pietists are saying, don't get involved. It's worldly. <clears throat> so we'll take this apart. So in 1517, Martin Luther starts the Reformation because he had a personal revelation that just shall live by faith. Very personal to him. But um, he's willing to stand up to the Holy Roman Emperor and say, unless you can prove me wrong from Scripture, here I stand, so help me God. Very personal. But some German princes want to break from Rome. And they say, this is my chance. Kingdom of mine, I just decided you are all now Lutherans. And the people in the kingdom were like, okay, uh, we're Lutheran. What do we believe? So for the people in the kingdoms, it's not the same personal experience Martin Luther had. It's just a new state doctrine, a little more scriptural emphasis. And so a revival movement starts called pietism that said being a Christian is more than agreeing with state doctrine, even if it's good state doctrine. You have to have a personal experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change and you won't do the worldly things you used to do, like go to the bars and brothels and lewd theaters and get involved in government. It turned into the German concept of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the church, the kingdom of the government, the two don't touch. There were even German princes that donated money to the pietists so they would teach their people not to get involved in the prince's business. I just read where George Soros and the Rockefeller Foundation are donating money to some woke pastors so they can have an after party where they can teach people, Christians, not to get involved in politics. Why? Because they want to get involved. And so four centuries of this teaching in Germany allowed Hitler to put Jews on train cars, and they're going right past the church, and they're crying out for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government doing that, and we're the church, and we can't get involved in government stuff because of their circle and our circle. And so let's just sing praise songs to Jesus louder. Can anybody see there's something wrong with that picture? And so um, you have the old lights, covenant form of government. Great. It's a plan we can rule ourselves without a king. But to some, it became only a plan and spiritually dry. Well, then you say, no, it's more than a plan. It's a personal experience with Jesus. But to some, it's so personal, it's only personal. And you're only going to worry about yourself and Jesus and forget what kind of world you're leaving your kids. And so... Um, 
Uh, now, there, the pietists did emphasize a personal experience with Jesus. And you've got the Moravians in Germany, and, um, and they helped influence the Wesleys, and this helped start their Great Awakening revival in America. The founder of the Lutheran Church in America is a Henry Muhlenberg, and he's a pietist. He's a don't-get-involved guy. And he has two sons, John Peter Muhlenberg, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. The Revolutionary War starts. And John Peter, here's Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty, Give Me Death speech. And he says, I want to help. And George Washington says, um, I'm going to make you a colonel. Go get your men. So he goes to church and he preaches a sermon out of Ecclesiastes. It's time for all things. Time to gather stones, time to scatter stones, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to preach, and a time to fight. He takes off his clerical robe and underneath he has a uniform of a continental officer. And he has an altar call. 300 men of his church kiss their wives and ride off to become the 8th Virginia Regiment. And then he's promoted the general, and he's, and he's elected to Congress, and his statue is in the U.S. Capitol. John Peter Muhlenberg taking off his, his clerical robe, and uh, what did they pass in that first session but the First Amendment? Now his brother, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, he's pastoring in, in New York, a Lutheran pietist church. He's writing letters to John Peter. You have become too involved in matters which, as a preacher, you have nothing whatsoever to do. And John Peter writes back, and accuses Frederick of being a Tory British sympathizer. Frederick writes back and says he could not serve two masters. Remember the two kingdoms the Germans have, the kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, I can't serve both. And then the British invade New York and burn Frederick's church. And then he decides, maybe I do need to get involved. And then he gets elected to Congress, and he's elected the first speaker of the House. The first speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives is Lutheran pastor, pietist turn getting involved, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. And what did they pass in that first session of Congress with Frederick and John Peter there? They passed the First Amendment. Does anybody honestly think that these two pastors would vote to outlaw themselves? Pastors aren't supposed to be involved in politics, even though we are pastors and we are involved. No, the First Amendment, as well as the first 10 amendments, were handcuffs on the federal government to keep it from becoming a big Frankenstein like King George III was, ruling people through mandates. And uh, now why can't there be a middle of the road? Yes, a covenant plan and a personal experience. So it is a personal experience with Jesus, but don't you want to leave a nation to your kids where they have a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus? Because if you don't get involved, what they're teaching the kids now is there is no God. And if he does exist, he is messed up, put in men and women's bodies, and you have to have operations to fix it. He's either making mistakes and confused up there, or he's powerless, or worse yet, he's sadistic. And if that behavior is not sin, what? Teaching sex outside of marriage. I mean, all these little books, here's little library books, look, all these different types of sex you can do. If sex outside of marriage is not sin, arguably there are no sins. And if there's no sins, you certainly don't need a savior to save you from your sins. So they're teaching an anti-Christ gospel. And you're enjoying your personal relationship with God, but you're leaving a country to your kids where they're, gonna, they're not going to have that chance. And so the most important thing is to bring people to Christ, but the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. Now, is it holier? Because we all know people that say, oh, our, our, we, we go to a church where we only preach the gospel. We don't get involved. Is it holier not to be involved? What do you do with Numbers chapter 30? It's the silence equals consent chapter of the Bible. Half a dozen scenarios. One, if a daughter binds herself with a vow while living in her father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day he hears, then none of her vows shall stand, and the Lord will forgive her. That's come down to us as vows in a wedding ceremony. And the pastor tells the church members, if you are silent when you hear these vows, your silence is giving consent to the vows, right? Speak now or forever hold your peace. It's called the rule of tacit admission. Uh, and it's in law. Like um, uh, here's uh, debt collection. Somebody owes you money and you wait 10 years to try to collect. Well, the judge will say you're past the statute of limitations. If you really thought they owed you money, you would not have been silent for 10 years, right? Another's trademark law. Somebody is, you make a trademark and somebody's copying it? 
And if you don't try to defend your trademark, the judge will say, well, you're, you were silent. You didn't try to defend it. They get to use real estate law. If you have a piece of property and somebody's squatting on it and, and you're not charging them rent, they, they can gain title to your property through adverse possession. Judge says, well, you know. It's even in our U.S. Constitution. Congress passes a bill, puts it on the president's desk. Article 1, Section 7, if any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days, the same shall be a law in like manner as if he had signed it. So all he has to do is let it sit there and be silent for 10 days, and it becomes law as if he had signed it. Silence equals consent. And so if a church member's silence gives consent to wedding vows, it gives consent to other things. And if they're killing babies in the community and the church members are silent, the church members are giving consent to killing babies. And uh, Leviticus 20, any Israelite or foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people altogether. All you got to do is close your eyes and you're cut off. Um, There was a bill last year to kill babies 28 days after birth. And enough people in California said enough, and they forced those legislators to reword it. Uh, Acts 22, the apostle Paul is talking to the Lord, and he says, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul didn't throw a stone. He didn't say a word, but he knew he was guilty for the death of Stephen just by standing there silent. Why? Proverbs 24, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't try to disclaim responsibility by saying you didn't know about it. For God who knows all hearts knows yours and he knows you knew and he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Mordecai tells Esther, there's a mandate from the government to kill the Jews. If you are silent uh, at this time, deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Here's an interesting one. Numbers 20. Moses and Aaron are called to the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord spake to Moses, Take the rod, gather the assembly, thou and Aaron, speak to the rock, and it shall give forth water. And they gather the assembly. Moses lifts up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly. End of the chapter. The Lord spake to Moses, Aaron will not enter the land, because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. It's like both. I just, we just read the chapter. Aaron didn't say a word. He didn't do anything. Yeah, that's just it. He heard God tell Moses, speak to the rock. When Moses lifted up the rod the first time and hit the rock, it probably took Aaron by surprise. When Moses lifted up the rod the second time, Aaron knew what was coming, and he did not protest. He didn't say, well, Moses, hold it. I was there at their door. I heard God say, speak. No, he was silent, and in that instant, Aaron was guilty. Moses's was a sin of commission. Aaron's was a sin of omission. Leviticus 5, a person sins because he did not speak up, even though he was an eyewitness to a case or knew what happened. Anyone who failed to testify is guilty. Martin Luther King, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting it is really cooperating with it. We all know this verse, Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know the verse right before it? Confront your neighbor directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. They're loving each other, but they're confronting each other. Uh, One translation says, rebuke your neighbor directly so you will not incur guilt because of him. And uh, Proverbs 9.8, Eight, nine, eight, rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Uh, Luke 17, if your brother sin, rebuke him. 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out, out of season, reprove, rebuke. And of course you can do it nicely. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. What does entreat mean? It doesn't mean be silent. It means you're petitioning respectfully, right? And so... We need to speak up. It is uncomfortable to speak up. It is uncomfortable. But every parent has to do it, right? You love your kid, you love your kid, but at some point you got to correct them. And so they have a tactic. And the tactic is to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. You say, what? 
Yeah, they say, if you're really Christian, you will be silent and tolerate us teaching something to the kids that Jesus would never teach the kids. I mean, would Jesus teach the trans agenda to kids? We know what Jesus taught. He says, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. And so they're telling you that if you're really a Christian, you'll be silent while we teach your kids something Jesus would never teach the kids. Yet Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. You know, <laughs> amen. So there's a Hollywood producer named uh, Rob Reiner, and he was on uh, the Archie Bunker show years ago with the character Meathead. And he just came out with a movie called God and Country. And he's, he's an atheist, but he's claiming that he's an expert on Christians, that he knows Christianity better than Christians, and he's trying to smear Christians that want to get involved and stand up for their kids. And think of the irony here. School counselors who cannot even define what a woman is think they are able to tell a boy is supposed to be a girl. It's like, define a woman. Oh, I can't define a woman, but I know this little boy is supposed to be one. It's like, define one. I can't define one. It's like, it, it's idiocracy. And um, so I think, I think it's going to be a rude awakening for churches that think they're being spiritual by saying, well, we don't get involved. When they realize by their silence of not getting involved, their silence is giving consent to all that evil out there. They're inviting the judgment of God on their heads. Now, a spiritual case can be made that Jesus cares about children. And uh, so the answer is local, local, local. I ran for Congress three times, raised millions of dollars. I can tell you all about that. But most people say, I'll never do that. But uh, we drive by a school every day. And if we know they're teaching something other than what Jesus taught. And the irony is that there are more people that go to churches in an area than vote in a school board race. So all you got to do is pick some mama bear and get behind her. And then when she gets elected, fill up the, the, board, the meeting ahead of time. Um, and now studying history and seeing how power keeps, you know, the kingdoms keep getting bigger, as more power concentrates into fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to get more and more people involved locally, right? Fewer people control things globally, more and more people involved locally. And so America started with people getting involved, the covenant form of government, everybody's involved in church, and then it turns into our civil government, everybody's involved in the New England and, uh, and so God wants us to be involved. Now, uh, maybe God's letting the evil expose itself to expose the condition of our hearts. Um, how much will we stomach? How much will we put up with? And, um, you know, you, you look, here's Satan clubs on elementary school campuses. And, and Disney's got FXX, a Hazel, a daughter of Satan cartoon coming out with. And then we got Grammys with Satan stuff. And then Target has uh, Satan stuff. And uh, Iowa State Capitol Satan statues, and it's like, hello, Satan. And then God's get, people are getting bolder, and God's like, okay, we're getting close to the end of the story, the end of the romance. We're the bride of Christ, right? And every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is pushing the world to this decision-making moment. He's like, okay, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I need you to hurry up and make your choice. <sighs> and he's pulling back the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz, you pull back the curtain, see this old man there. He's pulling back the curtain. He's letting you see it's Satan, and some people are going to be fine with it. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'll just tolerate that. I'll tolerate, okay, something else, I'm fine with it. And others are like, I'm sorry, I can't go there. And they cut the rubber band, and it snaps back. I can't go with hysterectomies on little eight-year-old girls because they went through a tomboy phase. Sorry, I can't go with castrating little boys because he picked up his sister's doll. And they cut the rubber band, and it snaps back. And there's a dividing. I think God's pushing the world toward this dividing moment. Now, some people say, well, you know what? I'm not going to get involved. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come and rescue me out of this mess. Who do you think you're going to meet when you're raptured? Uh, Jesus. Do you think he cares about the little children? Yeah. You think maybe he might wonder why you didn't do anything? I mean, we're not in China where you don't have a say. We're not in North Korea. We're not in Iran where the people don't get a chance to vote. In America, we the citizens are the king. And even if we can't turn it around, should, shouldn't we at least try? Shouldn't we at least show the Lord? And so what does the silence say about the condition of our hearts? Jesus said, in the last days, because evil shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. They'll get so used to all the evil. That just... And um, Ezekiel gets a vision from the Lord. And they cried, cause them that have rule charge of the city to come near. Behold, every man came with a destroying weapon in his hand. 
And he called the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said, go after him through the city, slay old and young, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. What's the difference between being slain and not? Does your heart sigh and cry? over the abominations of the city. You know, there's a praise song, Hosanna, 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 the highest, beautiful song. And there's a refrain in there that says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for the kingdom's cause. I thought, what an interesting line to put in a praise song. Break my heart. Do you think it breaks Jesus' heart to have these little innocent kids, what they're doing to them? And then sex trafficking. Jim Caviezel did the movie, and a lot of it takes place in America. And um, so Jesus didn't pet lambs all day long. Uh, his first sermon ended with them wanting to push him off a cliff. Another sermon ended with them picking up stones to stone him. Another sermon ends with them saying, this is a difficult saying, who can bear it? And they walk with him no more. He didn't run after him, so you misunderstood me. He turned to the 12, said, you want to go too? There's the door. Peter said, where else can I go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. Jesus is invited to somebody's house for dinner. The Pharisee noticed Jesus didn't wash his hands. And Jesus said, you Pharisees are more concerned about the outside of the cup and not the inside. You're like a sepulcher pretty grave, but inside full of dead men's bones. And the lawyer says, well, Jesus, by saying that, you're insulting us lawyers. He goes, let me tell you about your lawyers. You have burdens on people too heavy to carry and uh, don't even lift a finger yourself. You hold the keys of knowledge. You don't go in. You don't let anybody else in. And he's laying into them. And then the chapter ends. And you wonder if they ever got around to eating dinner. You sort of feel like got pushed out on the street, right? This is our loving Jesus, right? When to the Humble Jesus was loving as can be. To the prideful, he was tough as nails. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Right? Pride is the sin of Satan. Uh, It says, um, he who falls on the stone will be broken, but on whom the stone falls will get crushed. What does that mean? That means if we fall on the stone, we're broken. We admit, I'm a sinner. I've done terrible things. I deserve judgment. Lord, have mercy on me. He says, okay, here's mercy. Here's Jesus, right? You, you, you approach God humbly, you, you get all the grace. If you're prideful, I'm a real good person. I'm just, you hit the hard side of God, right? And um, here's a verse we've all read a thousand times. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. And, of course, Peter says you're the Christ. Well, who is John the Baptist? Well, he stood up to the corrupt King Herod. Who was Elijah? He stood up to the corrupt King Ahab. Who was Jeremiah? He stood up to the corrupt King Zedekiah. And, um, you know, we're social creatures. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected. And uh, here's Peter with a group around a fire. And a girl gets in his face and says, you are with Jesus. And you can just picture Peter looking around and everybody's eyeing him. And he realizes he's about to get kicked out of the group. And he said, I never met the guy. It's like, that's it, Peter, you caved so fast. It is a real fear to be kicked out of a group of people that we want to be respected by. You're not followed anymore and unfriended. And, and then after the resurrection, Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Sanhedrin said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. And Peter replied, we must obey God rather than men. Suddenly, Peter doesn't care about the group. It's like, what happened? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? I mean, Jesus had risen from the dead and was with him for 40 days, but Peter's still scared and hiding out. It's only when he's filled with the Holy Spirit does he have the backbone and courage to speak out and stand up. So maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is standing up to corrupt government. (laughs) Just saying, I can't be quiet anymore. I can't just stand silent. I've got to say something. There's something on the inside of me. It's like Jeremiah said, it's fire in my bones. I have to speak. And um, some say, well, I'm not going to do anything, but God knows my heart. Well, he knew Abraham's heart, but he still wanted to see Abraham be willing to take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah. It's like a guy watching football. And you say, hey, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? And he's like, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, okay, when was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? So oh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, dude, we need to have a little marriage counseling here. <laughs> People say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he wants to hear some words out of your mouth, and he wants to see some actions. 
And uh, even salvation is what? You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And then there's a prescribed action to get baptized, right? And so we are spiritual beings in a physical world. And we get a chance to show what's in our heart by loving the unlovable and rescuing those unjustly sentenced to death and getting involved and not being silent. And so um, God's pushing the world to this decision-making moment. You know, in closing, I thought of decision-making moment, um, why did God make us in the first place? You know, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Tiny spot, the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Tiny spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that tiny spot was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. It's not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And now with the James Webb Telescope, they can see it even clearer. And you see the red shift. So light travels in waves. Blue being the shortest wave, fat, and red being the, the slowest, the longest wave. And so they saw the red shift. You're, you're watching these galaxies moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It is so large. If you were to place Stevenson 2-18 in our solar system... It would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? What could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing. Except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I can make everything. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love, by definition, must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. So in the context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally created one tiny thing he does not control, your will. The challenge for God was to create something that he didn't control. One tiny thing he doesn't. Now, he could control your will if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he doesn't need our love. He's not incomplete and our love somehow completes him. He doesn't need our love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love somebody, the more you want that somebody to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But he will never force you. Because the moment he would force you to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him. And he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. You're made in God's image. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. And if you're made in God's image, could it be that loving and being loved is a big deal to God? Now, God loves everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? Galaxies can't love, rocks can't love, animals follow instinct. I looked up the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Not one time is the word love used to describe an angel's relationship with God. They worship God. They praise God. They glorify God. The word angel means messenger. They deliver God's messages or ministering spirits under the years of salvation. They rejoice when a sinner converts. They sang when the stars were created. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. They are mighty beings, they are very, very intelligent beings, but they're not made in the image of God, and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not mighty and we're not very smart. <laughs> you 
You know, a king can have a castle with really powerful soldiers and really smart staff, and then he can have children. Guess what? You look up the word man and God in the Bible, and the word love appears everywhere when it talks about man's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Psalms 91, because he said, his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings uniquely created with the ability to love God back. But for love, to be loved, it must be voluntary. Because if he were to force us to love him, he himself would know he's forcing us to love him, and he would know a response is not a love response, so he'll never force us. Now here's a question. How can God give us the free will to choose to love him and him still be in control of everything? Well, God created light. Light is a photon, which is a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field that travels at 186,000 miles per second. And visible light is one small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's ultraviolet rays and gamma rays and radio waves. And so when God stretched out the heavens, he also stretched out the electromagnetic field so light could travel across the heavens. And Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you could travel approaching the speed of light, for you, time would slow down. And if you could travel the speed of light, for you, time would stand still. God created light. He's faster than light. So for God, time stands still. We'll never comprehend that. But there is a verse in the Bible that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. Right? In other words, we are living in slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever-present now. I am that I am. When you are in God's presence, you cannot think about the past. You cannot think about the future. You can't even think. You just experience, I'm in the presence of all power in the universe, all irresistible love, terrible judgment. So for God to create our reality, he had to create a space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. In other words, he had to take now and stretch it out and slow it down. Why is this important? Because we make our little free will decisions in time, but he's outside of time. He can readjust every electron and every atom so that his will is going to take place. We all have GPS on our phone. You make a wrong turn, it recalculates. What if the guy in the car next to you is making a wrong turn at the same time and his is recalculating? What if everybody in the city is making wrong turns and it's all recalculating at the same time? What if everybody in the world, right? So we make good decisions. We make bad decisions. God's outside of time. He can readjust every little electron. So that his will is going to take place. So it's our limited free will in the context of his unlimited sovereign will. And it works because he's outside of time. And we sort of know this because if we're in a situation with, with somebody, right? And, and all of a sudden you realize, you know, it's no accident that you and I are here together right now at this moment. This is, this is providential. This is, this is a God-ordained moment. God arranged all the little electrons so that you and I would be here right now. And you feel the, the goosebumps up and down your back. You feel the presence of the Lord. And he does have a plan for each of us. And if we yield to the plan, we walk in the fullness of it. We are his workmanship created for good works. But we can sometimes fudge. And some will produce 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. There's the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. And then we could harden our heart and say, God, no. And Mordecai told Esther, if you don't let God use you, he's going to deliver the Israelites, but he'll just use somebody else. You say no, he's, he's going to get his will done. And then you can repent and say, God, I blew it. Give me another chance. And he can readjust all the little electrons and time, and he can give you another chance. And um, so God creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time so that we get our free will, but he's still in control of everything. There's a third thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his universe creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet as dead. It would be an involuntary response. In the presence of all power in the universe, it'd be an involuntary response. 
And God's like, I can do involuntary responses all eternity long. He is completely awesome. He said, I'm interested in this voluntary response. So he has to hide himself. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will is gone. In the presence of all, all power, irresistible love. I mean, boom, you just... And it would be involuntary, so he has to hide himself. And the same hiding of himself that gives us a free will necessitates that we have faith. Two sides of the same thing. I wish I could see it. Oh, yeah, well, if he shows it to you, you wouldn't need faith, but you wouldn't have a free will if you saw him. Right? If, if we need to be thankful that we don't know the future. Because if you knew the future, you wouldn't need going. I can see what's going to happen. No, but we don't know the future. So what is it? we have to seek God. He has to hide himself so that we have to walk in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time so we have our free will, but he's still in control. He hides himself. I was thinking of a way of explaining why it's important for him to hide himself. For our love to be love. Imagine if a billionaire has a son who goes to college and he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, and he's got Rolex watch, gold rings, fancy clothes. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside and drives up in a clunker, he's got holes in his jeans, all the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library, and they eat together in the cafeteria, and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then one day, he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're driving up to this castle mansion, and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. If Jesus would have come in his glory, every political ladder climber would go, oh, yeah, I'm your friend. No, he's born in a manger. This is in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah. There was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. So he creates us as free will beings that can love him back. He creates time so we have our free will, but he's still in control. He hides himself so that we can use our free will, but there's a last thing. He's just, and he cannot help it. He is just, which means he has to judge every sin. Because if he does not judge a sin, by default, he would be giving consent to the sin, that rule of tacit admission. And if he gives consent to one sin, one time he denies of his just nature. He denies himself, and he cannot deny himself. So he has to judge every sin. It's like in mathematical equations, there's constants and variables. In the equation of redemption, the constant is God is just, was, is, and forever will be just. The variable is who takes the judgment, you or a substitute. And so God could never, so, so he could never be loved back. Because if he creates real beings, creates time, hides himself, but if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, by default, he'd be giving consent to the sin. If he gives consent to sin, he denies himself, and he can't deny himself, so he could never be loved back. Until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son would become man, become the Lamb of God, and only as a man could God die on a cross in judgment for our sin. So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. The lamb is his way to love you without having to judge you. Abraham and Isaac going to the top of Mount Moriah. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. I'm trusting God will have the ram, but the other is God will provide himself as the sacrifice. That's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel. In this hidden plan, Jesus became man, and he took the wrath of a just God upon himself in our place. You don't have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being that is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, 
is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. It had to balance because God is just. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. It says the day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I read the book of Revelation lots of times, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's God that is pouring out the vials of judgment in the book of Revelation. Lamb breaks the seal. Angel throws the center. Angel blows the trumpet. It's like, why is it? Well, it's the final judgment. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was a sin way back when, and you didn't judge it, and you were silent. Were you giving consent to that sin? Is there a party that's unjust we didn't know about? Uh Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. Jesus took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. Experienced it as if it was a thousand years. And then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way you and I can approach this universe creating, omnipotent, all-powerful, and all-just God without having to worry about being judged. Because all the judgment we deserve went on his son, Jesus Christ, and we are approaching him through his son. The lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. He came up with it before the foundation of the world. He can love you for the rest of eternity. You can love him back and not have to worry about being judged by him. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit reaches out through you to share the love of God with a lost world. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death, defend the defenseless. That we get a chance to let the God of the universe love people through us. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor. God bless you.